Okay, welcome divas and dudes. I'm so excited to have you today at the Start Center for our nutrition class. I'm Suzanne Ryman and I am the owner of Powerhouse Bakery at Nutrition Matters Inc. And of course, Powerhouse Bakery is on hold for a time, but I'm still really excited to get to do nutrition coaching. Um, Praise the Lord, I'm nice and busy getting to help people. So um, if you do have any interest or if you know of anybody that's looking for a a dietitian for myriad of things, um, I would love to be able to help. So today what I want to go over is um, a topic that um, can sometimes be confusing. And I'm going to kind of introduce it with a really pivotal person in the anti-cancer way of life um, community. And he's no longer with us, but uh, he wrote an amazing book that will um, hopefully be something that you've laid eyes on before. And if not, it would be good to maybe perhaps get. So the anti-cancer way of life. And then I want to do an update on um, recommendations for soy. That's always um, a, a question that I get because there is still some equivocation in the in the research world and as far as what doctors recommend. So I'm going to try to shed a little light on it and help you, you know, make your best decision. Um, I'm an advocate of using soy-based products, as you know, with the goal of um, decreasing a group of foods and increasing another group of foods. So it becomes one of those really great choices. So um, Dr. David Servin Schreiber is um, a physician that wrote this, this amazing book. Um, He really comes to the world of of cancer research um, on a personal level because he discovered he had brain cancer, uh, which launched him into an amazing 13 years of research. And so he came into the industry with lots of um, interest in physiology. He was already a physician and a psychiatrist. Um, Not only was he a neuroscientist, but he also was a lecturer. Um, He's really from France, but he was lecturing all around the world on different ways to study the brain. Um, And he was also one of the founding doctors for the Doctors Without Borders, which is really cool. And that's, of course, now a a really amazing way that, um, you know, we can connect with people all over the world. And so I love the fact that um, now he has a really unique ability to share his research and his personal story. And really his goal, once he found out that he had cancer, was to pay it forward and uh, learn everything he can. And so um, in the 1990s, he was truly a a rising star in psychiatry. Um, It's it was kind of known and chuckled about that he loved Turkish cigarettes, Diet Coke, donuts, and riding fast motorcycles. Like any gentleman that's at the top of his game, he felt invincible. Um, only to find out that, no, he's human. And, um, you know, while we don't have all the answers for diseases like cancer, we can also learn a ton as we go. So there's many reasons why we get disease. And so learning... Um, strategies to cope with and to prevent and to slow the progression of is always our goal. He lived under the French paradox. Anybody ever heard of that phrase? It's so interesting. And of course, you know, I studied French for years, but also in the food world and in the health world, the French paradox term comes up quite a bit. And it's this strange set of circumstances that we know the Mediterranean diet is for, um, is for health. We, you know, that's kind of a tried and true term that we know the Mediterranean diet is healthy. But when we look at the French people, what do we see? Well, we see that they smoke cigarettes. We see that they eat high fat foods like cheese and even high fat meats. So what is it? What is this paradox that the French people still don't live and eat all that healthy, yet they have much lower incidence of the diseases that we see in the West, so in in the U.S.? And why is that? So some people speculate that it's, well, because they have a great lifestyle. Uh, They take a, a... a nap in the afternoon and their, their déjeuner is um, in the middle of the day. So they have um, more focus on meal time, more, more focus on family. They exercise more. 
So perhaps that's part of that French paradox. And really what I want you to have as a takeaway today is as we study uh, this amazing doctor and his, his journey and really the update in the science world, what I want you to have as a takeaway is that the wellness program is not going to be just one prong. There's multiple prongs in this whole process. Just like with the French paradox, we understand that people have different living situations that add to and subtract from their overall health. So it's kind of an interesting idea. So during his research, um, he was doing a study to um, evaluate different brain function and um, locations, and MRI uh, back in the 90s was um, really a great tool. It turned out there's, his subject didn't show up for one of the programs that he was doing, so he said, okay, well, I'll do it. So he got into the MRI only to find out that his brain had a, an abnormal about quarter size lump. And so that was, of course, the, the diagnosis that changed the trajectory of his life. Um, and what it really launched him into was understanding the body's strength from within. And while he understood that science and medicine had so much strategy, he understood at, through this 13-year um, discovery is that the role of spiritual connection was so valuable. Uh, the value of fueling your body with immune building or boosting ingredients and nutrients. And then a strong body that can fight disease if it's just given the right tools. And so that became his quest, and he wanted to leave that as his legacy. Um, and, you know, he did ultimately pass away from cancer, but um, he was given six months to live, and he made it 13. So was that because of the connection and the value and the strong fight that he put up? I'm probably going to guess yes. So this is his book, The Anti-Cancer, A New Way of Life. And it's dedicated to finding answers, especially because his colleagues gave him none. Um, you know, basically he said, okay, doc, what can I do? And the oncologist that was treating him said, well, nothing, just live your life. Enjoy every day that you can. And he was not okay with that. So writing this book um, really set the whole tone for where we are today, you know, learning that cancer does have multi-prong approach. And we are so lucky that ThriveWell has taken on this, this philosophy in such a robust way. And in fact, Dr. Lang was giving away or recommending these books. And so when I first introduced this um, several years ago, I, I bought a bunch off Amazon and shared them. So I don't know if maybe you have one in your library, but it's a good one to look back on. And um, when doing this research now, kind of the revisit of this book, I found some interesting um, reviews about his book and some had mixed reviews because they felt like maybe this book was giving false hope or that you know it was better than he was suggesting that it was better than uh, traditional medicine and I, I don't believe that I don't believe his book was trying to suggest you give up your chemo and instead you know eat um, grapes I, I feel like his message was that it's a multi-pronged approach but um, he sold over a million copies. It was a New York Times bestseller. And then he was asked to speak all over the world um, with this book. And it was truly the integrative approach to pre prevention and treatment. So I love the fact that his background in psychology and psychiatry really lended itself to making this whole puzzle really make sense. So his reflections on life and death and healing along with cancer, really helped open his eyes. Uh, the importance of love and laughter and the family unit were really the crux of the book. Um, and that, you know, it doesn't have to be your last goodbye. When you get the diagnosis, that doesn't mean that's a final end. It means now what are we going to do? We're given a new set of circumstances. Um, and so rejecting his former habits, Dr. David began to study the value of the non-traditional. And for a uh, professor and a doctor, especially from Europe, to do this kind of um, trajectory change was pretty impressive. So people were really taking note. Um, and so a lot of the book talks about the value of yoga and the value of green tea. In fact, he goes into detail of how long it should be steeped 
and you should drink it within 10 minutes of steeping. And, you know, he gets really into the detail. And that um, the value of yoga is uh, not just to add strength and flexibility, but it teaches us breathing and relaxation and a whole way to rest. And if any of you haven't taken a yoga class, I really encourage you to do that because um, when I used to teach fitness, um, I was you know all about high impact and how hard, hard can I work and how hard can I sweat. And then when I tried yoga, at first I thought, oh goodness, this is way too slow. I can't do this, right? And then I started realizing that there's so much between the pages that if we're not careful, we just flip the pages and we forget. And so it quickly became one of my absolute favorite modes of exercise because when you do it right, it is very challenging. It does work your joints and your muscles and your bones in a way that really asks for strength and it gives you a chance to slow down a little bit. So it's a, it's a fabulous uh, study that um, mainstream has really now um, embraced. And so I love the fact that his book probably played a little role in that, especially in the medical community. He also talked about how important it is to not be a, a workaholic. So, you know, commit to having no work today, one day or two or whatever your schedule allows. And it becomes um, important to think about your food choices every day. And it becomes about uh, a discussion around love and really spending time with family. And um, this little picture down in the corner is of my uh, family. We had a beach wedding. And I thought it was so fun because everybody was kind of doing their thing. And a beach wedding is so different than a formal wedding, right? You get to play and, and you just feel free and, and so in, in connection with nature. I just thought that was such a fun shot. Because I, too, am learning how to relax. Since Powers Bakery's closed, it's been a whole different chapter for me to respect family and to spend time with people that are important. And so believe me, I'm, I'm learning right along with you, and I, I feel like it's a powerful message to me, too. Um, because the real carcinogens are not too hard to identify because you guys obviously being here in our nutrition class, are very conscientious about nutrition. And so the real carcinogens are out there, but sometimes it's even more subtle than saying no to the triple Big Mac or the, you know, highly refined snack foods. Um, and, and a little hint to what I'm going to be doing in the next two meetings is looking at um, the non-nutritive sweeteners and their role as a carcinogen. So the reality is our world is constantly inundated with carcinogens. And so it really makes sense to us to have as many different shields and arsenals, you know, tools in our back pocket to combat those different potential carcinogens. So when we looked at Dr. David's real diet um, plan, he, um, of course, looked at the values of mint, green tea. He looked at olive oil. He even said, you know, a tablespoon a day is what you need. And if you've been around me long enough, you know that one of my recommendations is don't heat the oil. Try to learn to cook with water, with dry heat, of course, baking and, and poaching. But also, it's okay to use oils, but try not to heat them too much. And so... Um, you know, adding the oil at the end of cooking because that minimizes the oxidation of those very important essential fats. So we want to make sure that they are uh, intact and they're going to be able to do their job to help our body be healthy. And of course, spices are all over his book, which of course I applaud because you know that I really believe that we Americans under spice. We always think of like the food cocaine, right? What are those? Yes, sugar, salt, a little more sugar and salt, and fat, and then crunch. I told you the story, I know probably 10 times, the, the story of the Dorito chip, and that science and the food companies were so right on target when they created that snack food because it had the perfect combination of lickability because you want to lick your fingers with that pink, that orange stuff. It was sweet and crunchy and salty. And so... What I love to teach in my classes is what if we were to take out salt, or at least some, and sugar? We don't mean to say that healthy food should be bland. And that is unfortunately 
the expectation. When I used to work for HEB and one of my biggest challenges was to show the world that healthy can taste amazing. And whenever we would do interviews of people, their concept was, oh shoot, if I have to go on a diet, that means my food's gonna taste terrible. And it's because they just didn't know what they didn't know. And so adding spices and learning from other cultures becomes this wonderful reservoir of absolutely no, our food does not need to be plain or bland or boring if we take out what we call food cocaine. So if you haven't already, I want you to look in your spice cabinet and explore uh, what you have. Do you have some fresh, single dried herbs? like oregano, and if you don't already grow rosemary, at least Texas can grow rosemary, <laughs> right? The only thing that's alive in my garden is this beautiful rosemary, because um, it can stand the heat. But um, put some basil and some mint in a pot and move it into the shade, or maybe even into your house, because it's not gonna survive the 100 degree weather. Um, ginger is a fabulous root, it, it, very easy to grow. Uh, turmeric, and if you can, Try not to get dried turmeric. Try to get fresh turmeric. Have some good charcoal toothpaste nearby because it is going to stain your mouth. <laughs> um, but it's so worth it because of its freshness. It's loaded with all those polyphenols that not only are great for uh, fighting off carcinogens, but also for the flavor and does so much to the food. Parsley and cilantro need to be in every dish, not just a little garnish on the corner, but handfuls as part of your dish. I made a spaghetti squash uh, dish last night. I added for the sauce, I just added some goat cheese that I kind of melted into the um, warm spaghetti squash. And I added a big handful of fresh cilantro, another big handful of arugula, and some roasted garlic and tossed it together with a little bit of fennel fling and it was amazing. So. Think about all those layers of flavors that you can do. Um, gone are the days where we're just gonna have, you know, one flavor on our pasta or our grilled vegetables or, our, or um, even our steamed vegetables. Just have fun with layering them and really use those flavors. Is it okay to use the dry though? Yes, it is okay. I just mean the powdered isn't quite yeah. as fresh. On the rest of them too. Like yes. Yeah, definitely. Great question, Thyra, because of course dried is fine and powdered is good too, but sometimes we get the idea that if we buy that bag of powdered turmeric, we've got this, you know, holy grail in our hands. And what I venture to say is, yeah, that's good, but could we go from good to great and go over to the produce section and get some of the turmeric root? Yes. And it's fabulous. You can um, shred it and put it in a salad and everybody's going to think they're eating carrot. Um, it's not, it is a little bit spicy, but not uh, unusually so. And so it makes a really nice dish. So yeah. And then of course he talks about veggies and, and in our classes we've talked about the value of mushrooms and how there's a lot of research now going around different types of mushrooms and um, sort of the, the added benefits. You know, we talk about polyphenols and antioxidants, kind of this big category and mushrooms seem to be brimming with nutrients that might not be found just in the back of the label. There, there are these kind of esoteric terms that um, you know we think of as being great. And so, yes, almost most mushrooms have vitamin D because they're grown under special lights. So look for that. And then any mushroom is going to have some of these extra benefits. Um, seaweed, I know is a little odd for us, uh, but if you ever go to a, a Asian restaurant, try the seaweed salad loaded with nutrients. And then of course, soy, which is what we're talking about today. And then not to mention all the wonderful whole fruits. He specifically mentioned all the stone fruits. What do I mean by that? Yeah. Peaches, nectarines, plums loaded with nutrients and try not to skin them. I, my sister-in-law was in visiting and she brought some peaches and she was peeling off the skin of the peach. And I said, why? Oh, I don't like the flavor or the texture. I, I get it. It's kind of unusual. But if you can get in the habit of eating the skin, as long as it's been well washed, um, that's going to give you extra nutrients. So a little bit about soy. Um, anybody have any ideas about soy? Do you feel like, okay, I've heard this before, I think it's good, or gosh, I've been wondering about that. 
And that's really what I want. And so the handout that I've given you kind of helps you look at some myths. And so take a look at that as we're going through these slides and make sure you feel like you've got a good understanding of what I'm trying to share when we're discussing soy and the research. Um, you know, the questions are, should cancer survivors avoid, avoid soy? Uh, is soy bad for people with certain types of cancers? Um, what's the risk of eating soy containing foods? So th those are some of the questions I want us to be able to answer um, through the next few slides. Um, so the phytoestrogens in soy, when we, when we use the terms, there's a few different ways we, we look at soy. Um, in general, there's a big category called the isoflavones. And these are basically molecules, so structures that act a certain way in our body. And the phytoestrogens are a little subset of these isoflavones. And when something has a, a hormone-like response in the plant, it's going to have a hormone-like response in us too. So it's very mild compared to our endogenous estrogen. Um, but in general, it, it's going to have a mild um, hormone-like reaction. And that's what scares, scares us. You know, we think, well, gosh, if I'm taking a medicine that's trying to cut down my estrogen, why would I want to take something that's a phytoestrogen, which is a plant hormone? And so let's talk about that. Um, but also soy is a great source of protein, great source of fiber. It's very low in saturated fat, and it's a great source of complex carbohydrates. Um, so if you've never looked at the nutritional quality of edamame, I challenge you to do that. It is a fantastic food. We often talk about trying to get balance of proteins, carbs, and fats, so the macros need to be balanced in our meals. And what I love is that soy comes prepackaged in a good balance. It's got equal amounts of those macronutrients, just about equal, and so you know, a great snack um, when you're going to the movies or you're going to a, you know, baseball or a soccer game or you're driving from here to Houston. Having a bag of edamame is a great snack. It's not going to cause a raise in blood sugar. It's not going to cause you to tank because you don't have enough sugars. It's a really good food because of the fact that it's so well balanced. And so when we think of the isoflavones, um, the effect on the hormone receptor positive cancers, that's where we're really trying to understand. Do these compounds interfere with the medicines working to reduce the estrogen in our body? Um, and if the isoflavones deliver a weaker estrogen signal um, to the receptor compared to tamoxifen. So if tamoxifen's job is to prevent your body from getting too much estrogen because we're afraid that that would promote the cancer. How is this plant estrogen fighting that battle? Is it, is it triggering the growth of the cell, which of course we don't want, or is it a weaker form of estrogen that is filling that role but not promoting the cancer growth? That's kind of the crux of the decision or the, the question, okay? So if the isoflavones de deliver a weaker estrogen signal to the receptor, which is, again, your body's estrogen, then the isoflavones might be able to de decrease the cancer cell growth. And that's what we hope, that if you have this phytoestrogen that is a weaker form and it connects to the receptor sites, you have a little bit of the benefits. Because we know that when we lose estrogen, what happens to our bones? They are compromised, right? Now, tamoxifen is trying to help that too, but not everybody can take that one. And then um, really, you know, as, as our bodies stop making estrogen, um, well, our fat cells do a really good job of making another form of estrogen, which I put in your, um, in your list there of facts. And unfortunately, we don't really want our fat cells to be highly regarded by our brain and forcing our fat cells to proliferate because estrone is at least helping our body uh, feel better, right? It decreases hot flashes. Uh, its function is, you know, in our brain, in our intestine, our organs. Estrogen, uh, even if we can't have that form, our body says, okay, fine, I'm going to make estrone then. So 
The idea is that if we have a plant-based weaker form of estrogen, we can get some of the benefits and really very little risk. And that's, that's what we hope for. So here's where the crux of the, of the situation is. One study found that soy didn't increase breast density, which is the issue you know, with increasing breast cancer risk. Another study conducted on 5,000 Chinese women diagnosed with breast cancer showed a diet rich in soy did not worsen the prognosis. In fact, it even offered some protection. So remember, whenever we're looking at studies, we want to know, okay, is it a big sample size, which this one really is, 5,000. Um, the interesting part, though, is that when the researchers are looking at different cultures, Chinese culture, what do they, they start eating soy really young as part of their genetics, practically, because they are grown up with, um, they're raised with this kind of eating pattern. When Americans or um, Western countries try to use soy as a um, prophylactic or prevention for, so uh, for breast cancer or other cancers, it, it potentially has a different effect. And that's what worries researchers and doctors. Because if we start taking it later in life, would this phytoestrogen um, still have a promoting effect on those uh, cells that proliferate quickly, like maybe a cancer cell. Um, so what's important is that um, in your miss, I'm gonna hold this up for just a second. In your um, terminology down here, estrone is the main form of estrogen after menopause produced by the adipose tissue. Estriol is a weaker estrogen, which we don't really see unless of course we're um, pregnant. Now, of course in our bodies, we do go through different estrogen metabolism. So you will, you could certainly see some estriol, but it's not as prominent. Um, the estradiol is the primary sex hormone in women in childbearing years. So the hormone therapy that is going kind of hand in hand with this idea is that drugs that stop estrogen from being absorbed or drugs that stop the ovaries from being um, in the, in the, process of making estrogen, so anastrozole, tamoxifen, and letrozole are the ones that are trying to stop the um, production or the use of estrogen. And so I think what's exciting is that we're pretty sure that the Asian population has benefited from eating soy throughout their life. And so it's a little different qualifier. But again, in this study, and they didn't really break down how many women were, chi were Chinese descent versus um, you know, Caucasian. So that's something I, we could look at a little bit more, but it didn't worsen the prognosis. So that's saying a lot, that uh, a diet rich in soy. So then the question would be, well, how much soy is a normal amount, right? And so um, something like, um, maybe three to four servings of something that has soy in it a day. That's pretty liberal. I don't think any of us could say we eat three or four servings, you know, a day. Now, if we were Asian, well, yeah, we probably would. But now if you had a dairy intolerance and you had soy milk and you had maybe some soy yogurt and then you had some tempeh, well, there you go. That's not unreasonable and that's perfectly safe. The one area where docs are saying, you know what, I think we should be more conservative, and that's in doing soy supplements. And so for years now, I've been recommending just that, that it's probably um, a good idea to recommend that women not take a soy supplement because the what if, you know, we, we don't know how some bodies react. And if you've never had soy and now you're, you know, in your 50s and you've had a scare with cancer, either ovarian or uterine or, you know, um, of course, breast, and you start eating lots of soy, there's a slight chance that that increase in phytoestrogens could act as a promoter or it could thwart the work of your uh, estrogen blockers. So taking a supplement is probably contraindicated. And Dr. David's book talked about, he never even really mentioned supplements. What he did do was talk about Mediterranean diet and the China study, which again was really encouraging plant-based foods because of their overall benefits. Remember, it's higher in protein, it's lower in saturated fat, 
higher in fiber, all of those things. And so I feel like that's a really safe place to live. And I know that that's what um, Dr. Lang and I talked about, uh, Dr. Fichtel and I talked about. So I feel like um, it's a safe recommendation to say, as a whole, we Western patients that really want to avoid occurrence and recurrence of cancer, eating a diet that uses soy products as a robust part of your menu could absolutely be a safe and prudent way to go. Um, the World Health Organization, you know, is a big entity that makes recommendations and really looks at research to try to give advice and, and you know, what they say is that do consume a diet rich in vegetables, um, whole grains, nuts and seeds, do consume edamame, tofu, tempeh, soy milk, soy yogurt, do consume more um, of the monounsaturates, do include more whole fruits, um, and then it goes on to say um, avoid the supplements, at least for now. And so it's kind of along the lines of what I've mentioned before too, in that I'm not a big advocate of doing powders and potions and pills because A, we don't really know how well it affects the, the biome of our gut. And we have not seen um, really good research that says people that take supplements do better with this, this, and this. Especially when we um, sort of equalize the playing field. Because of course, people that take protein or powders and pills and products will oftentimes also be exercisers. So if you balance the playing field and say, not counting the exercise and not counting the you know, enthusiasm for eating healthy, could we, could we sift it out those other situations and say, did the supplements, powders, proteins, and pills, really make them healthier, right? And it, we couldn't do that. We, we couldn't, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, say, nope, it was from that stuff they bought. It was probably more of that stuff they did. And, and I feel like that's a really great thing to think about because you can save your money and you can help your gut biome by eating the real foods. Just like I mentioned with the uh, turmeric, you know, the whole root rather than the powder. Um, and we always talk about, you know, safety versus, um, you know, is it really going to do its job? that we're hoping for, so um, the relevance. And for the most part, tried and true is gonna be the food. We know that the food's gonna really help us. Um, and so it also talked about the importance of reaching and maintaining healthy body weight. And you know, again, that falls back to the estrone, so that, that sort of middle strength estrogen that our body wants to make as we um, pass through menopause, um, definitely will promote the fast growing cells. So we don't want more estrone than we absolutely need. And of course, staying active will really help that. Um, and so I feel like in general, that is gonna be the smart, smartest approach. And so thinking about ways to use soy and ways to use um, the Mediterranean diet, I think is always going to be the best bet and using real food as much as we can. So I gave you a recipe for a new potato. And has anybody heard of a Nicola potato? <laughs> it cracks me up because nor had I. And I thought, gosh, I must, I'm going to have to go down to Central Market to find these. Well, and I'm sorry I didn't include a picture. I don't think I did. Um, it, it looks like a beautiful, smooth, small white potato. So go to HEB next time uh, on your shopping trip and look for a beautiful, smallish white potato. What makes this such a popular one is that it's, it's um, fairly uniform in shape. Um, it's high in vitamins, so vitamin C and you know, lots of nutrients in that, in that white potato. Um, and it's easy to cook. So you can boil it, you can bake it, and it has a, a consistently good texture. And so I'm gonna borrow yours again just a second. Um, it's reliable with a firm wax, flesh, sweet flavor, and you know it's a staple. And so I, I bring that up because we still are sort of in the mindset that potatoes are bad. And I, I um, 
learned about this potato from the, the book by Dr. David and encouraging recipes that include complex carbohydrates. And so as I put together this recipe, I thought how fun would it be to add some extra omegas, adding in some tuna, and then you could make some garlic pesto, um, or you could skip that and just use your rapeseed oil, some lemon juice, a handful of basil and parsley and Himalayan sea salt. If you had any of the Joe Spice, because I think I gave it to a lot of you guys, here's another way to use it. Um, and it will be the most fabulous cold potato dish for these hot summer days. Um, and so versatile. So if you don't like basil or you don't have it, that's okay. Use any herb you want. Um, and don't peel the potatoes. Keep the skin on. Yes, you could get organic if you wanted, but it's certainly not obligatory um, because you know you can wash them really well. And remember that there's the additive effect of a food or a dish. Um, so you may or may not choose to get organics. Either way, you're going to wash them really good. And then you're going to add ingredients that up the scale of the quality of that dish. Now, in the same token, we could lower the scale right, of a dish. So if we we're going to make a potato salad that probably wasn't that healthy, we might peel the potatoes. We might put in copious amounts of mayonnaise. We might put, you know, sweetened pickle relish. I know I'm describing the typical Texan potato salad. Um, but I challenge you to turn it into a Mediterranean style potato salad. Add in some um, fish if you want or leave that out. But adding olives, maybe adding some mushrooms. You now can even get this fabulous um, jarred pickled mushrooms. Very interesting flavor. The Kalamata olive, um, right? And we know that olive oil is good, so the fruit is even better, so add olives more often. Um, I've just now been adding Kalamata to my salads and it's just so fresh. I get in a rut and I forget, just like all of us, how good these other foods are. So pour that in. If you haven't experimented with other canned fish, if you like tuna, experiment with maybe sardines or maybe some of the other larger um, fillets that are canned, loaded with omegas. And so that's a very Mediterranean style that really adds so much flavor. Um, even in this dish, I encourage you to add some of the edamame beans. They add a beautiful color. Um, if you were ever at the bakery when I had the bean medley, uh, Mary knows because she probably made it a few times, uh, adding fresh herbs and edamame to any other bean just brightens up the color and it really increases the nutrient quality of that dish. So every chance you get, think of ways that you can add in those wonderful things. And then taking on some of the characteristics of the Mediterranean lifestyle, which is part of that French paradox, and that is spending time with family and eating small amounts. And even if you're a grazer, no matter what, the small amount is better than the large amount. And so, you know, when we think about the anti-cancer way of life, wellness matters in a big way. And so, again, it's not going to be a one-pronged approach, but I do really want to endorse using plant-based soy as a healthy addition. So if you haven't used tempeh, I want you to try it. There's one that's at HEB that's my absolute favorite. It's called buffalo, and it's pre-seasoned. But oh my goodness, you will fall in love. It's very spicy. So you can buy the buffalo tempeh, cut it in cubes. I, I did this in a class for us a while back at Powers Bakery. Um, did a little quick fry and I added it to my big salad of arugula and kale and spinach and pumpkin seeds and a little scoop of that beautiful potato salad. And oh my gosh, the tempeh is so good. It's so spicy that I'm hard pressed to eat it by itself. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that means that it's taking away from the odd flavor of tempeh, which I think is probably why most people don't want to try it. So I really encourage you to experiment. So building healthy immunity is really what we're talking about because we know that all of us are interfacing with carcinogens every day that we can't control. So the fact that we can control what we put into our bodies is a really great reassuring factor. And so um, building healthy immunity is something that we can really take control of. We want to surround ourselves with a loving community because that, again, is super important. Uh, taking an active role in our healthy behaviors. 
And so I, I'm, I know I'm talking to the choir right here, but um, understanding the value of that and really being the matriarch of others in your family, I think is a great gift that we all have. Um, and really understanding the value of the intellectual, the emotional and spiritual connections that we have has just as much input on the health of our body as the colors on our plate. And uh, so, of course, eating a variety of colors ensures that we're getting a wide variety of nutrients. And the more colors there, the less chance there's going to be for the, the food detractors. Um, you know, one thing I didn't talk about a whole lot, but I'll just drop in as a last thought. And that is the um, estrogens that come from the processed packaging. So the xenoestrogens, um, so plastics that are heated. Um, when food is stored in plastic and, and, you know, we don't always know where that water bottle has been. Has it been subjected to light so that some of that bottle breaks down? So if you haven't already, find a favorite glass bottle that you can carry around and use as your refillable water bottle. Really powerful element there. Um, and then, of course, the last element there is to find a love for movement that lasts a lifetime. And as, as we all age, as I age, I'm learning that there are so many great ways to add activity. It doesn't have to be a formal one hour, get sweaty, work out as hard as you can. I remember my karate instructor used to say he, he did a really good job if we had to throw up at the end of our workout. <laughs> Teasingly, but there was a little hint of truth there in that 20-something guy, <laughs> right? right? And so the good news is that we don't have to work out that hard to get benefit. But what we do want is consistency. So always think, if I'm doing today what I think I can do tomorrow and the next day and the next day, then what I'm doing today is probably good. If it's too hard and you have to take a break because it was too much, maybe back off a little. And Absolutely, it needs to be fun and hopefully be a, a component of social engagement as well. Um, and that makes your well-rounded wellness matter. So hope this helps and thank you so much. Let's ask some questions if you have any. Mm -hmm.